Are you ready? Is we that the is ready. that the rolling in action ready signal? Rock and All right. Too bad there's no takes. Take one. All right. Okay. So it looks like we're ready. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome back to our third virtual tasting. Uh, and today we are going to uh, take a look and taste and talk about two new release Syrah wines. They're actually two wines in the latest club shipment that hopefully most of you have um, have received. I know that there's a lot of you that haven't picked it up here yet, um, but uh, we're going to be talking about the 2018 Parisima Mountain Vineyard Syrah and the 2018 Parisima Mountain Vineyard Syrah Clone 1. Um, as I did with some of my other tastings here, or the other tastings that we've done, I'll just kind of just start broadly a little bit about Syrah and our history with Syrah. Um, Syrah is it's really more well-known red grape, and it is uh, planted, you know, throughout the world and is successful um, actually in a lot of different places. It's another one of those very diverse, um, adaptable varieties. Um, where you can make great examples in really different locations as far as soils and climates. Um, we happen to be blessed with an area here um, where Parisima Mountain is in Ballard Canyon um, that is a really epic spot to grow um, and make Syrah from. Um, we started with Syrah in our second vintage in 1995. Um, at that time we were you know, searching for things that were going to be successful for us or hopefully be successful for us here in the San Inez Valley and Los Olivos and, and Ballard Canyon. And so we set about and purchased some grapes. We weren't growing any Syrah at the time um, from a few different vineyards throughout Santa Barbara, um, mostly in the San Inez Valley, a little bit in Los Alamos, a little bit up in Santa Maria. And one of the places that we bought fruit from, I'm going to mention them again, is Stoltman Vineyards. And um, we were lucky to get in on some of the first crops of the Stoltman Syrah. And we were pretty convinced, um, I can't say that it seduced me quite like the Grenache did that we talked about last time, um, but it made some pretty tremendous, dark, you know, rich, structured, powerful wine. And also, you know, really was true to what the variety is. Um, and its expression, both aromatically and, and in the flavor profile. And that is a lot of dark fruits. You get your blackberries, your plum, occasionally a little bit of blueberry, although we don't get a ton of that. Um, also get some beautiful spice characteristics, most likely and mostly like a peppery quality that really goes along with Syrah. Um, now Syrah, like I said, is a very versatile grape, so you can grow it in different climates and it just tends to produce a bit of a different wine, a warmer climate, like an Aussie Shiraz wine is going to be a bigger, you know, bolder, more fruit driven, more j maybe jammy style of wine, whereas maybe a French, you know, Northern Rhone Syrah is going to be a little bit more structured, maybe not as full bodied, but a rich wine, a uh, powerful wine, very age worthy wine but with a more savory, let's say, and spice-driven profile. Now in Ballard Canyon, where Parisma Mountain is, we, we kind of feel, we do feel like there's this convergence here. We have a question. We have some questions. So Sandy um, in South Carolina didn't get the PMV Syrah in her club shipment, but yes. she got the EXP Whole Cluster Syrah. Right. Should she opened that for tonight's tasting, along I mean, with the clone one? Sandy, you, you can do whatever you want. I'm not going to actually specifically talk about that wine, but really quickly, that was a wine that we made for our one and only um, wine crush foot stomp party here that we had um, during harvest in 2018, where we had a bunch of club members come um, and, you know, put on booties. A lot of them just went barefoot, stomped on these grapes, and then this is the wine that was produced from it. We made a oh, little under 100 cases for the EXP program for that wine. So it's going to be a real different animal than the two wines that we're talking about um, today here. Um, but, you know, you can definitely open that one and enjoy it, and you should be able to enjoy it over the long weekend. Um, so, yeah, for sure, if, if that's what you want to do, go for it. 
Um, that is true. Yes, some of you do not get the Parisma Mountain Vineyard Syrah, and some of you don't get the Clone One Syrah um, in your club shipment. So it just depends on what level and what club you're in. Um, a lot more of you get the Clone One Syrah actually than you do the, the Parisma Mountain Vineyard Syrah. That really goes out to some of our you know oldest um, club members from our original club after you know before it was restructured um, several years ago. Um, but know that all of these wines that we ship out for the club are available to anybody in the club. And what is that cool policy that we have about reordering or ordering after the club shipment? Taylor, can you refresh me on that one? Free shipping. Free shipping, which we already do um, right now <laughs> because of COVID. But uh, we do do a free shipping thing um, on reorders for the wine club wines um, after they are shipped. So circling back to Ballard Canyon, um, what I was trying to get to about Ballard Canyon is that it's kind of this area that converges this like cooler and warmer climate style all into one wine. So like I said, the warmer climate, you're getting a more fruit driven wine and a cooler climate, you're getting more spicy or savory driven wine. Um, and in Ballard Canyon, we have this cool ability to make Syrah that kind of crosses over all of that. And so hopefully in both of these wines, you're going to pick up elements of fruit for sure in both of them, um, but some savory and some spice qualities. And they're going to be a little bit different with the Parisima Mountain maybe hitting a little bit more on the pepper and the spice characteristic and the Clone One hitting a little bit more on that bacon fatty savory side, although that kind of savory quality um, is something that I love in, in actually both of these wines. Um, and that's really, to me, what makes Ballard Canyon so special. Ballard Canyon was an AVA that was created just a few years ago, I think five or seven years ago now. Um, and it is a Syrah-driven AVA. There's no other appellation in California that has as much of one variety Syrah for us in Ballard Canyon that we have in, ba in Ballard Canyon. So um, we like to say it's, it's California or America's Syrah um, AVA. Um, and really, again, due to that fact that, that it just makes this very special um, and high quality and consistently high quality wine for us every year, just about whether it's cooler or warmer, you know, we just get really good stuff off of Syrah. Um, and the last several vintages have, you know, really been epic 15, 16, 17, and now 18 um, in a row have just been fantastic. Uh, for the Syrah grape. Um, in Ballard Canyon, there is a couple of different soil types. Um, on Parisima, we have that, you know, limestone driven soil. Um, there's also a, a sandier part in the, in the southern half of Ballard Canyon. The Syrah seems to thrive um, in both soil types, although it can make a slightly different wine. Um, to me, consistently, again, it crosses over those flavor profiles of fruit and savory and spice. Um, maybe throw in a little bit of chocolate um, that seems to cross over all the vineyards um, in Ballard Canyon, really no matter how they're all made because all of us different producers in Ballard Canyon tend to craft and make the wines a little bit different and maybe are looking for different, you know, numbers or parameters or flavor profiles when we're going to harvest um, these grapes every year. So in 2018, as I said before, it was just a terrific all-around vintage. It was it's going to go down as, as one of our best ever, I'm sure. Um, the wines across the board, including and definitely including the Syrah, are all of extremely high quality. Um, and just to touch on these two wines, they're pretty cool. I didn't bring my handy map. Neil, can you jam over and grab my handy map real quick? Um, as we get into um, the Syrah wine here, um, Parisma Mountain is planted to a lot of Syrah. There's 125 total acres planted a vineyard on Parisma, about 365 total acres out there. And Syrah is this color here. So you can see that there's more of this purpley color. Thank you. Purpley color um, for Syrah than anything else on the map. And that is over half of our vineyards out here are planted to Syrah. Um, and what we did when we planted the vineyard was we planted all these small sub lots. You can't really see that here. You just see the, the bigger um, areas here. But within these areas are all these small sub lots 
that are various clones or selections, different you know, mutations of Syrah that we have planted on different rootstocks and on their own roots, some of them as well. Um, so to get into the first wine, the Parisma Mountain Vineyard Syrah, um, this wine is, is really crafted from all of these, most of these different blocks. Um, this block six area up here um, is a big part of the Parisama Mountain bottling every year. Now, we obviously, we call out some of the vineyard acreage here for the block six bottling um, itself, but just about all the other grapes and wine that we per make off of block six every year are going into this Parisama Mountain Syrah. So it gets Syrah from up here on the top level. It gets Syrah from the middle level, from the east side, from the center, and down low. Um, I want to say it's a blend of, uh, uh, I want to say about 18 different Syrah picks, uh, which could be different, you know, combinations of blocks. Um, and then uh, it's, it's blended all together. So to me, it really is a great reflection of the whole property and what, you know, Syrah can do off of all of these different blocks. Now, we have... I don't know, I think about seven different selections or clones of Syrah, and there is a difference between a clone and, and a selection. If everybody, anybody's interested in knowing about that, I can touch on that. Um, this wine has, you know, a lot of 3D3 up here in block six. It has some 174. It has some Estrella. Um, it has this really wonderful area down here um, of 877. Uh, clone Syrah, which is, is always a big part of this wine. And then it actually is including some new areas of Syrah over here on block four on the eastern part of the property. And what's really cool about that part of the wine, they're relatively younger vines, although some of them are now hitting about a, a decade um, in age. Um, is that they're planted on their own roots. So whereas all these are, are grafted onto a rootstock, this part of the vineyard right over here that is going into the wine now is all own rooted Syrah. And again, we can talk about that a little bit as well if you want to, if anybody has a question about it. So the wine being a blend of all these different areas and blocks and clones, you know, comes across is, is a lot of what I described about, about the flavor profile of Syrah in Ballard Canyon. It hits on those fruit notes, it hits on some savory notes, and definitely hits on some, you know, peppery, spicy qualities um, as well. When I look at both of these wines, we definitely have no problem with color. Um, Syrah is a very dark pigmented grape, and it is a very dark, you know, wine for us every year. Looking at the two of them, there's deep color in both, with maybe the Parisima having a slightly more reddish tinge to it, and the Clone one having a, a blacker, darker red quality to it. Um, but back to this wine, again, if you pick it up and you, you take a, a smell of it, you just first off get it you know, jumping out of the glass and you get a ton of fruit um, on the get-go, a lot of plum, a lot of blackberry uh, quality and flavor, um, aromatically, I should say, in this wine. But it also has a nice gamey kind of s uh, savory quality to it, which is, I think, is something really cool about Parisma Mountain in particular. I don't necessarily get a ton of this kind of gamey, savory quality um, out of, of Syrah uh, from other producers in Ballard Canyon, but there's something about this wine and the combination of clones, and then I think some of our techniques in the winery, which I'll get into in a second after this question. Kay is wondering, if Syrah is on its own rootstock, are you wor not worried about phylloxera? Um, Kay, to be totally honest with you, I'm not really worried about phylloxera. Um, I think our farming practices um, and what I've seen, you know, with biodynamic and, and phylloxera vineyards, um, I feel like we're in a really good position um, to deal with any um, phylloxera if it should pop up out there. Um, granted, we are taking a bit of a chance, obviously, planting it on its own route, but I think the chance really gets outweighed when you start to taste some of these individual lots and the quality that we're getting off of them. Um, is really outstanding. I mean, one really cool thing that we love about the own rooted stuff is that it, on its own root, it just it just requires so much less water. Um, through those drought years, we were probably doing half as much irrigation um, on these own rooted blocks, and we were doing on some of these rootstock um, planted blocks. And I think that is certainly something that that we really love, and um, certainly is something that we're conscious of. Um, our kind of 
jump into own rooted stuff actually happened many, many years ago with the blockade Grenache block. Um, and then subsequently after that, we started to do some different varieties of Viognier and then wanted to do some Syrah um, off of it as well. And, and really it's been in the last 17 and, and 18 vintages that those newer blocks of own rooted stuff have started to come through and be a part of the Parisma Mountain Vineyard Syrah. So yes, thank you for the question. Um, so anyway, back to the wine a little bit. We, um, like our other red wines, we, we'll bring this in. These are, these are de-stemmed wines. They're fermented um, in a combination of different size vessels, anywhere from a, as small as a ton to up to those six-ton fermenters I talked about last time with the Grenache. Before we do the Grenache harpers, we can actually, you know, turn those over and make some Syrah into them um, as well. And um, all those fermenter sizes, I mean, I think for me, the ton and a half to three ton size is probably the best size. Um, so most of these wines, all of the clone one, and then um, a lot of the Prisma are made in that size vessel. Here again, we like to cold soak these grapes. Um, got another Steve, question. What is cold soaking? Is question about cold grapes? soaking. Well, cold soaking is really what it sounds like. So the grapes are harvested at night. Um, and they're brought into the winery, hopefully really cool. Not every night is cool, but just about every night we try to harvest, it's cooler out there. Um, so we'll bring them in. Um, if they're not cool enough, we have some temperature control. We can you know, crank the temperature down to cool the grapes down a little bit that are in the fermenter um, if they need to be. The cold soaking is a way to really bring out fruit um, in the wine. It's basically just the grapes and the juice all just kind of soaking in these fermenter tanks. Um, for anywhere up to maybe as much as five days before they want to start to ferment. Um, so you get some nice color stability that way and you get some nice kind of fruit qualities um, that stick kind of through the whole process of winemaking when you do these cold soaks. Um, so the cold soaks happen and then after day five, four, five, six, seven, these wines start to ferment. And again, these are uninoculated. These are native or natural, however you want to say it. Um, fermentations for their primary and again for their malolactic. Now something we've learned to do with Syrah is that we tend to make, you know, we have grow really phenolic Syrah, right? It's dark, it has a lot of color, it has a lot of tannin to it. And so some of our first efforts at Parisma were really big wines. They were really extracted, they were firm, they were structured, they were definitely, you know, wines that, that you know, really needed time. Um, in bottle and in barrel before they were really you know more approachable and drinkable and then after a couple years we started to look maybe um, to some different techniques on how we can get away from maybe this little bit of what we were thinking was over extraction of these grapes um, and so what we do now is we one don't let the temperatures of the ferments get as hot as we did back then but we do like warm temperatures when we ferment Syrah. It provides that you know, extra added depth and extraction of color, um, flavor, and tannin with more temperature. Um, and then we like to, uh, um, what was I saying? Flavor, color, and tannin. Yeah, so, um, oh yeah. So we um, have learned to do something, kind of stole it from other people, maybe from some other areas, and that's you know how things go in the wine business is there's a lot of thievery going on and sharing of ideas and thoughts. Um, we started to drain the tanks when they weren't completely dry. Most people, when they ferment um, in their fermenters on the skins, they'll let them go dry, but prior to draining their tanks and pressing and, and, and barreling down and stuff like that. But what we started to do was to press them off a little bit sweet. So there's still, um, some residual sweetness and sugar from fermentable sugars in these wines when we're putting them um, into the press and we're draining down the tanks. And what we found was that it just helped to, you know, kind of light, I don't want to say lighten, but not extract as heavy because you get a lot of extraction of tannin, especially towards the end of the ferment. Um, so by pressing it off a little bit sweet, and we're just talking like maybe zero bricks, one bricks, two bricks, three bricks of sweetness, so not a ton um, of sweetness, um, but just get them off the skins and we're left with a wine that's more textured, more rounded, um, does have you know nice structure to it, but maybe not as uh, big of tannin um, and extraction as what we were um, doing years and years ago. So both of those, both of these wines have that kind of idea in them. 
So hopefully you can taste that when you get it into the mouth. I mean, again, I went over the aroma of the wine. Let's go ahead and give it a little taste. Yeah, so, you know, very soft upon entry. Um, it does have some nice richness and roundness and definitely has some structure towards the back end of the wine where you do get some more tannin um, that comes through in the wine. Um, but very rounded through the mid palate, very rounded upon entry. And I think that's some of what I was talking about in that kind of more gentle extraction or maybe lightening up the extraction of the wine to make it a little bit more presentable and approachable upon release than some of our older wines were. Now, I'm not saying that this wine is meant to be drank young because it is still a little bit young and it is a little bit tight. If I were gonna drink this wine you know, now, I would definitely try and decant it a little bit prior to um, drinking it or leave the bottle open for a half a day or a day and uh, you'll get more smoothness and roundness um, and length off the back end if you do that wine. But again, flavorably, you got this nice kind of round, you know, ripe, you know, blackberry quality to it. You know, definitely pick up some chocolate um, in the mouth on this wine. And the finish has this nice spicy kind of peppery quality that really lingers for a long time. Um, it's a pretty elegant wine. This wine over the years has to me become not so much about size and extraction, but a little bit more about its elegance and length on the palate. And really happy to see that even at such a young age, this wine was really bottled just a few months ago. Um, it's already showing that nice texture and roundness. We have another question. From a very important person, your wife, Susan, is wondering who are some of the early Syrah producers who influenced you? Well, I think in Santa Barbara, there's really one person that was um, the main influencer for Syrah, um, and that would be Bob Linquist, the creator or founder of Coupe Winery. Um, I can't say that, that we've maybe followed his path. I mean, our vineyards are in different location. They have different weather than, than where a lot of Bob's, you know, vineyards um, and coupe wines are made from. Um, they're made from a little bit cooler area than what we have, um, rather than a more moderate to warm area in Ballard Canyon. Um, but he was definitely a big influence for anybody who was making Syrah um, in, in Santa Barbara County. Um, for sure. So I would say around here, it's probably, you know, Bob would be the number one. And that's a good question, Susan. I was going to point that out to people, but maybe it slipped through my mind um, in the beginning intro part. So um, again, back to the Parisma Mountain. I just really, it's one of my favorite Syrahs to make every year um, because it does pull from all those different areas like I showed you on the map. Um, so it's just got so many different parts um, qualities and characteristics from all these different picks and all these different clones and different parts of the vineyards at different elevations and different aspects um, that really just comes together beautifully and I think to me is a really great expression of, of what Syrah is on the overall when we look at the overall picture of Parisma Mountain um, and I would maybe even go so far as to say it's a nice look at at Ballard Canyon Syrah too because it it reaches up to the rim um, the top edge of Ballard Canyon up there in block six and then all the way down to the more canyon floor um, as well. So um, really enjoy making Parisima Mountain Syrah every year. Um, again, this is a wonderful follow-up to the really successful vintages that we've had over the last several years. Um, like I said, 15, 16, 17, and now 18. Um, really wonderful uh, wines and great quality for the Syrah. Um, moving on to the Clone One wine. This wine, again, a little bit darker colored. Um, Clone One has a little bit of an interesting story to it, um, and that is it's a selection of Syrah that was brought in from Australia into California in the 70s. Um, so it it's actually it was known as a Shiraz clone or Syrah selection because um, the Aussies call Syrah Shiraz, um, but they are the, the, same, the same grape. Um, the uh, Clone One 
first harvest was was 2000 off of that block uh, the blocks that we make the clone one and i guess i could point out what those blocks are maybe you saw them before but the clone one comes out of this section every year there's two parts to the block planted on two different rootstocks the heart of the wine is about two and a half acres planted on something called 110r um, and uh, the other part of the block is planted on something called 5C. They were both planted in 1998. So they were in, what, 20 years old for the 2018 vintage. Um, we first identified this block as being something different and unique and special in the 2001 vintage. Um, we crushed and started fermenting these grapes. And there was just this, this quality to it that was really different from all the Syrah fermenters that we had going uh, that year. And it had this, this wonderful like roasted uh, coffee, espresso quality to it, um, which is something that kind of maybe is a product of the fermentation of these grapes. I, I think you get it a little bit in the finished wines, but it's really a quality of the ferment um, and what you get aromatically and flavor wise when the grapes are fermenting into wine. So that initially kind of set us off as to there's something you know unique and special um, it is a very dark uh, colored Syrah wine it is also a fairly big um, extraction you know kind type of selection of, of Syrah um, makes a fairly big rich kind of in your face wine interestingly enough this area is towards the bottom of the vineyard um, and it kind of is one of the later Syrah um, vineyards to to um, to break its buds every year so it's one of the latest ones to get started every season but it's typically one of the first if not the first Syrah block um, that we're harvesting off of so it's a very efficient grower um, in a slightly condensed uh, season versus some of our other blocks um, that's probably partly clone and then partly the location and the block elevation um, that's that's determining that um, it is a very dark you know wine it's very dark in the fermenter uh, so it's also something that's separated out um, it has you know very powerful qualities both in flavor and in structure to it um, and we really look to highlight those qualities in the winemaking. So similar to the Parisa Mountain grapes, these are brought in, they are cold soaked, they are fermented, um, they are drained down a little bit sweet. Um, they're allowed to finish fermentation in the tank prior to be putting into barrel where they're finished their malolactic fermentation. Um, and through the years, we've kind of worked with a few different cooperages, a few barrel makers to work and really um, work with barrels that really highlight and kind of you know help to build on the expression of what is inherent in these grapes um, year after year after year and again it goes to that that roasted you know kind of quality um, i think you still get a little bit of that roasted it's maybe not so espresso coffee um, at this point but it does have a little bit of that roasted kind of smoky um, quality to it this wine, unlike the Parisma Mountain, doesn't necessarily, to me, touch on some of the spicier aspects of Syrah. It definitely is in more of that uh, fruit-driven style and that savory um, different style. So I said there was a bit of gaminess in the Parisma Mountain. The gaminess in this wine, the, the savory quality is more of a bacon fat quality in the clone one. Um, and let's just take a little, you know, smell of that and you can just tell um, just by the initial impact of the aroma that it is kind of leaping out of the glass just a bit more than the Parisma Mountain is it is a little bigger a little bit more intense uh, profile it definitely hits on a lot of that dark fruit the bl more blackberry a little bit less of the plum that we got in the Parisma Mountain um, and then definitely has that roasted quality and definitely has that little bit of bacon fat quality to it as well. Um, there is a little bit of, of new oak, actually fair amount of new oak on this wine. Um, and I think that, you know, what we've learned and through working with these 
cooperage houses and these barrel makers is to really tailor these barrels to really highlight the wine. So what I really love about this wine is it does have, you know, 60, maybe even up to 70% new barrels every year, but it's so integrated into the wine upon release. It really is, you know, hard to tell to me, is that the barrel or is it the wine? And that's just really a, a cool, you know, kind of kind of thing when you get to when you find that combination of wood and wine that just works so seamlessly together. Now in the mouth this wine's a little bit more forward. I'm just saying that without even tasting it because I just I just know it is. A little bit heavier, a little bit richer. It definitely attacks your palate really you know quite a bit up front um, has a big mid palate and some really nice kind of acid qualities that really help to lengthen um, the wine on the back end tannins are incredibly seamless on this wine they are there they are present but they are like velvet um, even in a wine so young as this yes what food would you pair with clone wine syrah well, you know, you know, my go-to with any Syrah is lamb, uh, for sure. And I know we had a vegetarian ask if there was some sort of vegetarian, you know, dish or something last time. And I don't know, I'm not a vegetarian, so I'm not totally sure. But I would say anything that's grilled or, or roasted again um, would be a really good compliment um, to this wine, uh, for sure, actually both of the wines. I think, you know, equally you can do, you know, the game and the lamb and those kind of things with both of these wines, you know, with the size being just a little bit bigger, a little bit more extracted and slightly heavier in the clone one. Um, I think you can probably do some steak as well uh, with the clone one or with the Paris of a mountain. I probably would lean again towards something that's maybe not as heavy as, as a, a steak, um, but that's certainly doable with this particular one. All right, we have another question from a, another VIP, James, who has been with us since 2004. James, is watching. long time. He says, I'm ready to try the 08 Clone 1 I received in my club shipments. Yes. What can he expect and look for in the 08? Oh, yeah, 08 was a, a really great vintage for the Clone 1. Um, I believe um, my friend Neil, you know, was probably the, the person who sold James that bottle. Uh, we do have a great library of clone ones and these clone ones really age um, exceptionally well. Um, you know, I think at 10 years old, that wine is really resolved. You know, it's even more seamless as this one and this one is super seamless. Um, it's probably built a little bit more body, a little bit more roundness, a little bit more finish as aged wines do. Um, the oak quality in the wine is probably even more integrated. Um, I know that we recently had a 12 vintage wine here that we had open and you know the oak and everything was really seamless um, as can be in that wine. Um, so I would say open that sucker up James and just get ready to enjoy yourself. Hopefully the wine's not corked. <laughs> <laughs> Got another question. Okay. Um, Bruce recently got the 2017 PMV Syrah. How does yes. the 17 differentiate from the 18? Good question. Yeah, I was thinking that we might touch on that because we're, we've been selling the last few cases of the 17. And I was just told well, there are only 10 more of those cases left and then the 2017 vintage will be gone. Um, to me, the 18 is, is a slightly riper vintage. So the 18 is gonna have a little bit more fruit to it um, in the plum blackberry uh, quality versus the 2017. The 17 is definitely a, a hitting on that savory and that spicy peppery quality with more of a blackberry fruit, whereas this one is coming off a little bit more in the plummy um, fruit category, which is just showing that it's just slightly riper um, vintage. So it's maybe, you know, maybe a half a brick you know, 0.2% alcohol or something higher than the 2017. Um, 18 just has such great balance. It has great, such great seamlessness. Um, the 17, you know, was a little bit, let's say, um, you know, just needed a little bit more time when it was young. Um, 
but it should be drinking beautifully um, after a year or more now that it's been in the bottle. So that would be my comparison, a little bit more spice, a little bit more pepper quality in the 2017 versus the 18. So anyway, awesome question. So the clone one, back to that guy. Um, you know, again, like I said, this thing was isolated. We have this wonderful library of these vintages going all the way back to our original one in 01. Um, the 01 was just such a standout wine and still is a standout wine today at, at age, what, 16, 17 um, years old. These wines are really built um, to last. And I think this 2018, for as good as it shows today, um, wines don't necessarily need to be overly tannic or overly out of balance for them to age really well. I think wines that have balance all the way through from when they're grape juice to when they're fermenting to when they're young wines in barrels to when they're young wines in bottle and older wines, they have just this balance to them. You know, great wines have this balance to them. And I think this 18 clone one just already shows and has always shown this incredible, you know, balance quality that's really going to allow it to age really gracefully over, you know, several decades, I would think. Um, it may even outlive me now that I'm getting older. You know, some of these wines that I'm making might, might be, you know, in their prime after I'm gone, sad to say. But it's great to make something that you can, you know, know that you're going to leave a lasting impression um, on people when you're not here anymore, although that's really depressing. We're not going to talk about that anymore. So anyway, um, really just loving this clone one. Um, just the seamless quality, the balance that it has. Um, I think it's a really, you know, great follow-up. And, and I was a huge and still am a huge fan of the 2017 Clone One, really most of the Clone Ones that we've made, I'm a big fan of. Um, what is interesting, we have these, these uh, higher end wines, the, the limited production Clone One, and we also have the Block Six, and they're really pretty different wines, and I'm kind of getting off subject of these two wines here, the Parisma and the Clone One. Um, but we almost have camps of people that are Block Six camps, you know, lovers, and we have like Clone One lovers. And um, I, I mean, I cross over, obviously, because, you know, I make them all and I, I love them all. Um, but we definitely have kind of distinct camps in our membership and our customer um, base that, that, you know, maybe some leans towards this Clone One and some leans towards the Block Six. The Block Six is definitely has this earthy, you know, savory spice quality that lovers of that flavor profile will lean to where, you know, the, the Clone One has this, you know, really impressive wealth of fruit um, and that, you know, like I said, that gamey, bacony quality um, that really some people gravitate towards. So again, we have these two wines in different camps. What's really cool about Parisma Mountain in general and the fact that we can take this grape Syrah and make these different bottlings and have them be, you know, pretty different from each other. Again, they're Parisma Mountain Syrah, so they have this link to them in their flavor profile, but how they attack your mouth and the structure that they have, the acid, or more acid or less acid, or more tannin or, or whatever. It's just really fascinating to me and really just a wonderful, you know, aspect of what we can get off the diversity of Parisma Mountain. So Susan and John are both drinking the 2013 PMB Syrah. Oh, cool. That's a great one. Um, 2013 was, was a, you know, hopefully it's great. I mean, I'm just, I'm not drinking it now. Um, but from what I remember, it was a really fantastic vintage. I mean, 13, you know, to me was, was one of the, you know, greats. I think I say that about like almost every vintage. <laughs> People are probably like, this guy, man, what is he drinking? He's drinking his own Kool-Aid is what I'm drinking. So, um, you know, 13 Parisma, you know, really powerful vintage. Um, it was kind of the beginning of the drought year, so it has some of the, you know, drought. There was, it was heat that year, but it wasn't as hot as like 2014. So the wine still has some freshness. It still has some acid. Um, really, after five years of bottle age, it should be kind of like in a really prime spot for drinking, I would think, um, based on, you know, our history now of making, you know, 20, 20 plus vintages of Parisima Mountain Syrah. Um, the Parisima Mountain Syrah, like the Clone One, 
is is very age worthy as well i mean we we recently had the 99 vintage which was the first vintage that we ever made off of very young vines and the wine is still you know very exciting um today and and just a really high quality so i would say enjoy that 2013 because you're getting it you know in really prime condition so jim has actually just enjoyed the 99 syrah and he said it was tasting great now, you touched on this earlier, but Jim's wondering if you can talk about the EXP Whole Cluster Syrah. I, yeah, again, the EXP Whole Cluster, um, which all, anybody who was at that wine stomp party should you know buy the few extra bottles that we have of that wine because you guys are the guys that really made that wine. Your footprint is all over that wine, uh, <laughs> literally. Um, so we had this great crush party it was the one and only grape crush party that we ever have ever done here at beckman um, there's probably a reason that we've only done one and we don't need to get into that now um, neil has some just wonderful highlight pictures of this great you know look this is grape crush this is neil's i don't know if you guys can see that can you see that yep. this was the beginning the end what what was it neil of the grape crush so similarly we basically brought in some grapes, kind of picked them a little bit early um, because they weren't quite ready at the day of the party, but we had this party going, so we had to, you know, make this happen. Um, and we had these uh, picking bins, basically four different picking bins, um, filled, half filled with grapes, and people got to foot stomp these grapes, you know, kind of like I Love Lucy, you know, kind of style, you know, old school style, um, making wine. Um, so we just took those grapes and we put them into a, after they were stomped, actually very macerated with all the feet that were on top of them that day, um, put them into another vat and fermented them and, you know, had the idea all along that it, we were going to make this club wine, um, this EXP wine out of those grapes. Um, again, we made about 96, I think, cases of that wine. Um, and it was basically just, just made that way with the whole clusters. Now, it's a really different animal than the two wines that we're trying here today. One, it was picked at a lower sugar number. Um, it wasn't quite as ripe as these two wines were, so it's gonna, you know, again, be a little bit different flavorably, big flavor wise because of that. And then fermenting it with the whole clusters is really different than making a wine and fermenting it um, off of D stem and slightly crushed up fruit, um, where you get, you know, maybe a little bit less of the extraction um, with the whole cluster that's kind of replaced by this you know really different flavor profile that you get out of the stems being in there and then the fermentation process of being more of a whole berry fermentation where the fermentation was really taking place inside of the berries rather than the juice and everything and the mixed up in a crushed you know kind of berry lot so it hits on more of that spice is more of the forest floor quality more peppery a little leaner it should age tremendously well um, the wine you know on uh, i haven't actually tasted since we bottled it a few months ago um, because we were you know kind of saving it all for the for the wine club members um, but um, from what I remember, you know, it was definitely a wine that, you know, should be decanted. Um, it definitely needs a little bit of age to it. Um, so if you have that wine, I might hold off on bottling it. I mean, drinking it, not bottling, drinking it. Um, but if you want to drink it, then definitely give it a little bit of decanting. Got another question. What does EXP stand for? Yes, the EXP program. A lot of people think it's experimental which I guess could be something that's really about EXP. What did I say EXP was? I don't know, exceptional. There's so many different things that EXP experience. could be, the experience. I think what we try to do with the EXP program is to do things that are out of our norm, right? Whether it's making a whole cluster Syrah wine like that EXP or finding a specific Syrah clone like 383 and bottling it separately. And then also doing some really cool blends in that program, the aggregate, which is basically everything that we make here, Cabernet, Syrah, Morvedra, Cunoise, Grenache, Merlot, everything goes into that wine to the La Finca blend, which is this, you know, Grenache, Syrah, Cabernet wine. Um, I, you know, in a way it is experimental, in a way it is the experience. So any way that you want to put that EXP um, to words is, is okay by me. Um, 
but it was an idea that, that we had just to keep things fresh, to keep the wine making crew you know, interested and excited, to do things that are different, and then hopefully the members of the EXP club, which not everybody is a member of the EXP club, although everybody could be a member of the EXP club, um, although periodically, because you know sometimes there's a little wait list as it keeps growing. Um, but um, they're, they're just wines made in really, really tiny, tiny productions where we're just expanding our horizons and expanding our minds a little bit in our winemaking um, and really just trying to have fun and to bring fun and different and unique things um, to you guys um, on a consistent basis at least four times a year. So good question. All right, another good one from Pops Romance. How is 2019 vintage comparing to 2018 so far? Well, you know, 2019, um, you know, is a totally, you know, different animal, I guess. You know, it was a, it was a pretty moderate year, um, kind of, after all those years of drought and having very dry conditions, we actually had a lot of moisture, not necessarily rain, but we had a lot more fog, which was typical of this area a long time ago. That's the way at least I remember it um, before we went through that drought and all the heat, you know, hot, dry years that we had. So a lot of fog, a lot of moisture in the air. It was a milder year. It was a later year. Um, the wines are a little bit higher in acid, um, which is really exciting. Um, we had just, again, really beautiful conditions in the fall that allowed the grapes to hang out on the vine and to ripen. Um, it's a little bit young now for me to say and where I'm going to put it on the, you know, the scale of all the vintages that we've made. But there's great promise for the 2019s for sure. There's wonderful flavor profiles and, like I said, just really bright, um, high acids that keep the wines really fresh. Um, young and, and very inviting so far. Haven't actually had a chance to do much blending of the 2019 Syrahs yet. That's on the books for probably the week after next. Um, we just got through kind of some bottling period and then we're going to quickly get into some blending here. Um, the Grenache wines we did blend a few weeks ago and those have been assembled from 2019. And if they're any indication, then we're really looking at another very consistent and high quality year in 2019. So anyway, thank you for the question. So. Um, it's been an enjoyable tasting. I really am huge fans of both of these 2018 releases of these Syrahs, both the Parisma Mountain and the Clone One. Um, there is you know, a pretty big price difference. The Clone One is much smaller production. It's about twice as expensive as the Parisma wine. So if you're looking for a wine to hold on to and sell her a little bit, I would say the Clone One. Um, if you're looking for something that's a little bit, um, you know, a little bit more affordable and something maybe you want to drink on a daily basis or maybe weekly basis, depending on who you are, um, I'd maybe look towards the Parisma Mountain Vineyard um, Syrah. We're going to be back here in a couple of weeks um, to talk about a new variety um, that was just released in the last club shipment as well, and that's our Chenin Blanc wine, something that we've wanted to do here at Beckman for a long time, and then finally, um, after 20-something years, have actually made our first Chenin. We're really excited about that wine and the quality. So we're going to be back here in a couple of weeks, because next week I'm going to be um, not around um, for the latter part of the week, but I'll be back um, after that. Um, and we'll start talking about the uh, 2018 Chenin Blanc at that time. And then also in the beginning of June, I just want to mention that we have a totally new project um, coming. Um, and the announcement of that is going to be at the beginning of June. It's actually a new label for us and a totally new wine, um, or actually two new wines, two new releases. Um, so we're really excited about that. I just wanted to, you know, get the word out to those of you who are paying attention, watching us today, um, and let you know a little bit early sneak peek at these two natural wines that we're making here um, at Beckman Vineyards under a new label and a new name called One Ingredient. So we will see you in a couple of weeks. You guys have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend, and I hope you enjoy the tasting, and we will talk to you soon. Thanks for all the good input and all the good questions. Have a great weekend.